Escape Club is the nothing personal word of the day for Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. I'm going to do this all week because it's A, my birthday week, but B, I love numbers. Two, two, three, two, three. I mean, that doesn't even match, but it's still cool. February 23rd, the Escape Club, they have a song called The Wild Wild West. And that's what we're going to start the show with because the all-star break is over. We are ready for the last 23 games of the NBA regular season, and it is going to be an amazing month or two as we head into the playoffs. But I am focused on the wild, wild west because if you're an NBA fan, everything's going on in the Western Conference. Every interesting story. Even LeBron James, who's sitting there out of the playoffs. Remember in basketball, it's not just you make the playoffs. There's now this play-in tournament. So four teams fight for two slots. They all get to say they made the playoffs because they're in the play-in tournament, even though if you lose the play-in tournament, you're not in the playoffs, which means you shouldn't be able to say you're in the playoffs. But when you do marketing and selling season tickets, you say you were in the playoffs, even though it's just a tournament. But the Lakers can't say that because they're out of the playoffs. So LeBron James met the media and said, hey, you know what? These 23 games, they're the most important regular season games of my career. I smiled because when you've got LeBron James' resume and his rings, obviously the games in the playoffs, May and June, mean much more. They always have been. And he's worried that he's going to be locked in with Kobe's last season in L.A. or Jordan's last couple seasons in Washington where the teams were not successful. But LeBron, to me, has transcended that. And this is not me calling him the GOAT by any stretch because you know where I stand on that, having gotten absolutely destroyed by Jordan and watched him be the killer that he is on the court. LeBron telling you that these regular season games matter shows to me what a competitor he is. He is not mailing it in. The Lakers underwent a complete change to their team at the uh, trade deadline. I was just watching Pat Beverly say, hey, screw the Lakers, after he posted how great it was to be on the Lakers and they traded for his friend, D'Angelo Russell, and then boom, he's gone, and now he's devoting his life. Russell Westbrook switches locker rooms. Oh, I've never been to Staples Center for a game. Coke, I wonder whether or not the Lakers and Clippers share a clubhouse. This is easy to find out. I wonder if there's two home clubhouses. I would doubt that, and they may just switch it out. Do they switch out the carpets? Like from Lakers to Clippers, the way the Giants and Jets switch out the turf at MetLife. I wonder about that. But Russell Westbrook didn't have to travel far. He's playing. Oh, what did I call it? It's Crypto.com. Sorry. Is it still called Crypto.com? I don't want to give any credit to Staples or Crypto.com, but maybe SPF will have it be named FTX. Let's talk about these storylines in the West that are interesting me that we have to watch out for. We're about a week away from Kevin Durant debuting with the Phoenix Suns, making the biggest trade that we've seen in many years. Recency bias guaranteed with that statement. Kevin Durant comes in a time when the Suns are not one of the best teams in the Western Conference. Their odds of getting out of the Western Conference are not, they're not the leading contender by any stretch. Even with the existence of Kevin Durant, it is unlikely they make it out of the West. And I love the new owner going all in. That's what all the fans want. He's going to take the court. Does he have the most pressure of any player on a new team? And my answer is no. The most pressure for sure is on Kyrie Irving, which is ironic because I'm sure he feels the least amount of pressure. Not sure that he cares about leaving dumpster fires behind him. But his teaming up with Luka Doncic, that's another move by Mark Cuban, the owner of the Mavericks, to say, hey, I want my second ring, and I now have two superstars. We've got one more month to make this work. Remember, at the deadline, when you acquire someone who's basically a pending free agent, which is what Kyrie Irving is, it's a rental. You don't get that a lot in basketball the way you do in baseball. In baseball, we love it. You bring in a rental at the deadline and you say, hey, if it works out, great. If not, great. But either way, we're letting him go. We probably are not going to sign him. And that is how you decide how much you give up in a trade. When you're bringing back a rental for only a few months or if the rental you get the rest of this year, but he's still arbitration eligible for one more year, which means he's not a free agent, which means you get him for that year and a bit then you give up a little more in the trade. The Dallas Mavericks gave up to get Kyrie Irving enough that I thought he was signed for three more years. 
unless of course they tampered and they have already a deal in place. But would you trust a deal in place with Kyrie Irving? And I'm not impugning the veracity of his character. I am merely asking without a deal in place, you don't give up the type of assets the Mavericks gave up to get Kyrie Irving and you bank it all on a few months when your team is not in any way positioned to get out of the Western Conference either. So the Lakers have a struggle to even make the play-in tournament, although Darvin Ham is talking a big game. The Dallas Mavericks are struggling to get out of the Western Conference, even with Kyrie. The Phoenix Suns are not favored. How about the Golden State Warriors? How do you dismiss the defending champions, the dynasty? There's two, I'm trying to remember, has there been a time, now this really is recency, I'm gonna have to go back, and we didn't talk about this before the show. Has there been a time when three sports have all had dynasties at the same time? So when the Patriots were having their dynasty, was there a baseball dynasty? I don't think so. The only baseball dynasty that's happened, maybe the Giants in 10, 12, and 14 were a dynasty. So maybe we can look back and see if the Patriots were a dynasty at that time. But then who was the basketball dynasty? Right now, you've got the Warriors who are a dynasty. You've got the Astros who are a dynasty, but no one in football is. Maybe you could say the Chiefs are having made five or five AFC championship appearances in a row. I don't think that makes it a dynasty. Although two rings, they're on their way. But the Warriors, what do you do? Steph Curry has been hurt. He's getting older. Clay, Draymond. Curry hasn't played in almost three weeks since February 4th. And he, they already said, we're a few weeks away from having him back. And we know without Curry where the Warriors go. So I don't think the Warriors are positioned to get out of the West. So now here we are. No Warriors, no Mavericks, no Suns, no Lakers. I got it. I've got my pick in the West. It is the greatest player in basketball right now. Apologies to my hometown, Giannis. But you have to look at Nikola Jokic and say, he's going to win his third MVP in a row. Something that LeBron never did, something that Jordan never did. The last guy to do it was Larry Bird. Celtics fans remember that back in the mid-80s when Larry Bird, you just never saw anything like Larry Bird. I don't know why he's never in the conversation for the GOAT. Like, he's got to be in the conversation, doesn't he? As one of the greatest of all time. Although that's what GOAT means. I don't know why I said that. But for those of you who didn't get a chance to watch Larry Bird, he was magic. Pun intended. The problem with Jokic winning his third MVP and he's averaging a triple-double, the averaging a triple-double thing was really cool when only Oscar Robertson had done it. When Russell Westbrook did it, it was less cool. Now that Nikola is doing it, it's more cool. But still, I'm more interested in what the team's going to do. And the Nuggets have been nothing but a disappointment. That's all they are in the postseason. And why? Coca nailed it. He said, they need a, they need a killer. Did you use that word pre-show? Is that twice we've said it? In the playoffs, you need someone, especially in this day and age in the NBA, where it's one on four isolation, chuck and duck, sort of the all-star game, not on steroids. The problem with Jokic is he's so good at getting everyone else involved, but do you trust him to take over a game? And here's the way to ask it. If you need a basket at the end of a game to win a championship, who in the NBA do you want with the ball? One possession, I love these things on Twitter. You have one possession. It's like you have one at bat. Who do you want to take the at-bat when you need a sacrifice fly? Who do you want to take the at-bat when you need a home run? Who do you want to throw a pitch if you need a strikeout? I may have gotten to the mute button fast enough there. This is a different soundboard. Coco, did you by chance hear the remnants of last night's comedy show? It's not out of the question that you did, and I apologize. You can maybe take that out of the show if you possibly can. I'll give you a clean wipe for 869. Excuse me, excuse me, Steve Martin and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Excuse me, may I use the bathroom? Thank you. I wonder if I have to do that when I'm doing a show. Not when I'm doing it on tape like this, live to tape, but when we're live, Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays for now on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. <sighs> I can't just leave in the middle of a show. Okay, so the problem with the Nuggets is, what do they have, Murray? Jokic, they don't perform in the playoffs. So the Nuggets are not going to make it out of the West. So let me review. The Nuggets aren't going to make it. The Mavericks aren't going to make it. The Warriors aren't going to make it. The Suns aren't going to make it. The Lakers aren't going to make it. What is going on? 
All right, we're gonna go live right now to the standings. And I'm gonna go through team by team with you and I'm gonna ask you a very simple question. Who is it that you think is gonna win what is the most competitive conference? Who haven't I mentioned? First place, Denver. Nope, can't make it. Second place, Memphis. Spoiler alert, Memphis. With the guy who I told you I'd rather have on my team than Zion Williamson, Memphis. Third, Sacramento. Name me three players on the Kings right now. Kevin Johnson. Randy Smith. Fourth, Clippers. Ah. Paul George. Kawhi Leonard. Russell Westbrook. First round, losers. Wait to see. Not official, but it will be official when the playoffs start. Phoenix, talked about. Dallas, nope. New Orleans, give me a break. Minnesota, has Rudy Gobert possibly been the worst trade in the history of sports? Yes, not Minnesota. Wait, Golden State. Nope, Oklahoma City. That guy with the three names, I like him. Coco, what's his name? Uh, Gregorius Alexander. Am I close? No, probably not. Gilgis Alexander, that's damn close. They're good. Are they going to make it? Nope. Hold on, Utah. Nope. Portland, ooh, Lillard shooting from half court, nope. Lakers, eh, nope. San Antonio, nope. Houston, yes, that's my pick. The Houston Rockets. Did you see that video during Mardi Gras of their owner, Tillman Fertitta? We call him Fertitta Fertitta. God knows what he's doing in Houston, but he actually was interviewed, totally hammered in Mardi Gras. Go check out the video if you can. There are rights or issues with CBS that we can't show it. Whatever, who cares? NFL, baby. So he gets interviewed and they're talking about the second half of the season, which is not really the second half of the season. It's post All-Star break. And he says into the camera while hammered, pray for Victor. Does that not put a smile on your face and a little warm feeling in your overstuffed belly post Valentine's Day? God, I wanted that to be different. I wanted it to be post Halloween or post Christmas or post Thanksgiving. What do we post? We're just post like a Wednesday night. Victor is Victor Wembayama, the guy who's seven foot nine, who is French. And he's got a wingspan that's 12 foot two. And he's going to be the first pick of the lottery. And he's a game changer in the way Patrick Ewing was a game changer when the Knicks got him in the lottery. The way Zion Williamson was a game changer for the Pelicans when they got him in the lottery. So Victor's coming to the Rockets because they're praying for Victor. You want to talk about tanking for Tua, we're praying for Victor. But the Houston Rockets aren't making out of the West. So by process of elimination, this is like, have you ever taken, side note, a multiple choice test? and you didn't know the answer, and it's a multiple choice test where you don't have to leave it blank where because a wrong answer doesn't make your score worse, so you might as well guess. How do you guess? Do you do process of elimination, try to cut out one or two, and then guess between the remaining two if it's only A, B, C, D? The dreaded E, all of the above, or F, none of the above, used to drive me crazy. I had a system that I was taught and it's a quick system. When you don't know a question on the LSAT, let's say, or on any sort of exam, you look at your watch. And in the old days, damn it, there was something called the second hand. And what a second hand does is it proceeds around a dial 60 times, and that makes a minute. And if you split 60 seconds into quadrants, you have 0 to 15, 15 to 30, 30 to 45, 45 to 60. And wherever the second hand is, when you look at your watch, when you don't know the answer to a question, A, B, C, D, that's what you do. Okay? Got it? Memphis is getting out of the West. The All-Star game was a disaster. The ratings came out. NBA is trying to figure out what they're going to do. You spoke. The audience spoke. They're not interested in watching Damian shoot from half court. They're not interested in Ole defense. They're actually interested in a basketball game. The NBA is going to have to figure out what to do. We did a show on it two days ago. I want to give you an official way to see that ties in everything that's going on to give you an idea behind the scenes. When you're negotiating a new collective bargaining agreement, you are talking about not just the economics of the game. You're talking about rule changes. You're talking about international play. You're talking about jewel events. One of the things that's negotiated is going to be changes to the All-Star Game format. The NBA can't just wake up and do it. You work in concert with the union. This is an official way to see, Coca. There is going to be a change in the All-Star Game. 
and it's going to be part of the new CBA, which bonus wait to see will be done by the end of March before anyone opts out. All of that is going to happen. Now, if you think there's not enough time, you're wrong. There is enough time to do it because they look at the ratings and we tell you, this is this is PR, where we tell you we don't focus on the ratings or we do a release that shows the positive, we'll choose a demographic. Like, I don't know if you know this, but the 2023 All-Star Game was up 4% in the 70 to 75 bracket, right? We'll look for something positive so we can spin it and we do it in concert with the TV networks because we want you to think that everything's good but you can't hide what happened with the NBA All-Star Game. You can't hide the decline in ratings, viewership, comparing it to last year. And then worse of all, you can't hide the fact that they are so far behind the Pro Bowl that they can't even see it from here. And when that happens, that's when change comes. And the best thing about change that I like is that it leads to creativity. Someone's got to sit there and figure out what they're going to do. And they're going to figure it out and they're going to figure it out quickly. So official wait to see, Coca. Changes to the All-Star Game are coming in the new CBA. All right, pick of the day. We did not do a pick last night. So we are 24 and 31. The NBA is back. We're going to the NBA. If you had to win a pick, and I feel as though it's a must-win pick tonight, when we're back to seven games under 500, who am I gonna rely on? Yes, I'm going back to LeBron James. When LeBron James tells you that he's gonna focus on a regular season game, you better look out if you're the Warriors. The Warriors are without Curry. The Lakers, while they haven't played a lot together, they haven't practiced as a team a lot since, if at all, since the trade deadline. They're given five and a half to a, the Warriors who can't win on the road. And they're playing at Crypto.Staples Arena. We're taking the Lakers and we're given five and a half. All right, we come back. We're going to review a movie that is very old, like 50 years old that I was asked to watch. And then we're going to update the situation in Alabama with their player who played Brandon Miller last night and basically won the game on his own while everything surrounding his off-court activities is very much still in the news. We will be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Thank you for making it through the gauntlet of ads that we don't see revenue from. It's David Sampson and Matthew Coca. Please tell your friends about us. Spread the word. We're still growing. We're not going to stop growing. We're like the HGH podcast. We're growing. Is it genuine? Yeah. Is it being helped? Not yet. Could we use some HGH? Yes, we can. Where's that going to come from? Hmm. Wait to see. I feel like whistling bad news bears. Okay. So I met TJ Miller on a train ride, and this is not a joke. Uh, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was on a train visiting my son, coming back for a show, and I met TJ Miller, the comedian and actor, and he asked me, we spoke for the whole time, and he asked me to watch a movie that I had not seen because he couldn't believe I had not seen it. And we were talking about each other's podcasts. And he said, you have to review The Long Goodbye. And I said, well, I haven't seen it, but I promise you I'll watch it. A movie directed by Robert Altman starring Elliot Gould. Elliot Gould is someone who some of you may only know from Ocean's Eleven. He's the one in the bathrobe, the older guy. Not Carl Reiner. Not the one who goes to the safe. But Elliot Gould is a very, very famous actor, was married to Barbara Streisand, not why he's famous. And he was in this movie playing Philip Marlowe, who was like a gumshoe detective. And he chain smokes the entire movie, literally the entire movie. He always, every scene he has a cigarette in his mouth. Robert Altman is a very famous director. If you haven't seen his work, you should. What struck me about this movie is unlike Splash from 1984, which I just watched again this past weekend. And it didn't age all that well for me because I remember watching Splash and how I felt the first time I watched Daryl Hannah and Tom Hanks and John Candy and Eugene Levy, the guy from Schitt's Creek and Second City. It just didn't age right. And not because of the way it was filmed. I just didn't think the humor was spot on anymore. Just one of those things. When you go back, it's hard to get that feeling again that you had the first time. The thing about The Long Goodbye is I'd never seen it, but it's filmed, obviously, it's 50 years old. 
but I found myself not caring about the graphics, not caring about the, the, the type of film that was used and how old it looked. I was really caught up in the genius of the shots and the script and the story of Philip Marlowe and what he is trying to figure out and sort of the gruff way in which he acts. The Long Goodbye is a movie that uh, I never would have seen but for T.J. Miller, so thank you. And you may never have seen but for me reviewing it. So if you like the reviews, and Coca, side note, there are people asking where you can get all of our reviews, every movie we've reviewed. This is episode what number? 761 of regular episodes. We've done a bunch of sit downs and a bunch of bonus episodes. So I don't know how many are in the audio feed necessarily, but Coca may tell me. But if you wanna know, there is a spreadsheet that if you tweet Coca, at tweet Coca and follow him or follow me, we'll give you the, the um, link. And it's the actual spreadsheet that this show uses to keep track of the movies we've watched and all the other things that we do. Does it keep track of wait to sees and our picks of the day as well? If it doesn't, it should, because there's nothing to hide. We do it all publicly. And we revisit the wait to sees because you should. The Long Goodbye, Elliot Gould. Classic. Enjoy it. All right, let's give an update on what's going on in Alabama. Something happened that is, uh, again, we've got a lack of advice coming. And that just is something very important. You remember the story from yesterday, Brandon Miller, the Alabama, he's a first year player in Alabama, the second ranked team. Somehow he was in a car that had a gun, brought a gun to a former player, Darius Miles, who used a gun to allegedly kill someone. What was Brandon Miller's involvement? This is what's being discussed. He's not a suspect, but he is a suspect, but he's not a suspect. He hasn't been charged with anything. He's cooperating. All of this is true. Everybody is innocent till they're proven guilty. When you are a witness to a crime or you are a potential suspect in a crime, there is a pretty simple rule, which is, Shut up. When you are asked to talk to authorities, to the police, you get a lawyer, you answer questions very simply in very short answers, period. You don't offer more than you are asked. You don't fill in gaps of silence with blabbering about the night and you don't have your lawyer release a two-page statement. I understand why lawyers do it. And I don't know Jim Standridge, and I don't know the law firm in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Crow, Nover, and Standridge. I don't know if they're trying to make a name. I don't know if they're the most famous law firm in the world. But to me, it is almost professional malpractice, if not malfeasance, to release the type of statement that he released yesterday. He's got a kid as a client, a kid who in some way was near or around or involved in a murder. And he comes up with a statement trying to explain to you why the media is mischaracterizing his client's participation as though the authorities give a flying rat's ass about this statement. That is the something that all lawyers know. When you are trying to sway the court of public opinion, which is why you release a statement, when you're trying to somehow get into a jury's mind doubt or trying to give them the facts as you believe them to be, there's a court of law where facts come out. There are rules of evidence. If you're involved in a case, you don't lay out the facts of the case in public beforehand. It's not looked at kindly by a judge or by a jury actually. But for whatever reason, there's a two-page statement about the facts surrounding Brandon Miller's presence at the scene of a shooting. And I want to draw your attention to a paragraph in the statement that really was something. Ready? There's something about a car. There's something about a gun in the back of a car, but don't worry, the gun was covered by clothing. He had no idea there was a gun. He got a text that said, hey, bring in the paint or whatever it's called. Some expression for a gun that I don't know about. The statement makes clear that my client, Brandon, has never touched a gun, never held a gun, never done anything. Then there was some question about his car when he went to pick up the, student, the, the, the guy who ended up potentially, allegedly shooting the person. 
Was there like an Uber situation? Did he drop off someone and then pick someone up? It's all a big mess. It'll all come out when actual facts are given under oath. When a case is presented, what I hope will be a capital case. But in this statement, the lawyer actually said, Brandon did not block the Jeep driven by Mr. Johnson. Doesn't matter if you don't know who Mr. Johnson is. Doesn't matter if you don't know the story about the Jeep. It just matters that he said Brandon did not block the Jeep. Great. In fact, Brandon had already parked on Gray Street. Doesn't matter. When the Jeep pulled up behind him. Terrific. The street was never blocked by Brandon's vehicle. I never knew a vehicle could block a street. You couldn't go on the sidewalk, but it doesn't matter. Here's the paragraph. The street was never blocked by Brandon's vehicle. Gunfire erupted shortly after the Jeep arrived. <laughs> what? What happened between the car arriving and the gunfire erupting? Did, did Darius jump into the car and grab the gun and throw the clothes away and walk out and start shooting? But Brandon didn't leave until the gunfire erupted? I'm just saying there's quite a bit of yada yada going on. And the yada yada is the whole damn case. So before you release a statement that includes a whole lot of yada, you may want to check your ego at the door. Because I'm not impressed that you can release a two page statement about the facts surrounding and how he did nothing wrong. And you're going to end the statement with Brandon does not own a firearm. We'll find out has never even handled the firearm. You better be right about that. Moreover, he had no knowledge of any intent to use a weapon. Hey, bring my gun, J-I-C. Listen, you want to bring some weed just in case you want to get high? I'm in. You want to bring some candy in case we get hungry? Hell yeah. You want to bring a condom because you think there's a chance you're going to have sex? I'm in. Bring my gun just in case there's some sort of argument that takes place and I'm going to want to shoot someone dead? Give me a break. Just ridiculous. I don't know what's going to be. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I don't even know how to transition to this. Major League Soccer starting Saturday. <laughs> How's that for a transition? Just go right into it. I don't know what's going to be with Miller, but I do know what's going to be with Major League Soccer. Can we use that as the transition, Coke? All right, ready? Better? All right, I'll do a better one right now. Four, nine, 69. In other news today... Major League Soccer has announced that they'll be starting their season this coming Saturday. Leave your firearms at home. Don Garber, who I have had contact with many, many times as we were trying to bring an MLS team to Miami and build a stadium right behind Marlins Park, which was the original dream of the mayor of Miami. And my original dream was to have economies of scale use one sales team to sell Marlins and uh, a new Miami soccer team. But we could not get a deal done with David Beckham because David Beckham had the option to get the team in Miami. He ended up getting a team in Fort Lauderdale. Now they're building a stadium in Miami. I think, I don't, wait, Coca, do you have any friends anymore in Florida? Do we know anyone in Florida anymore? I mean, I'm a PNG in Florida, but I don't know why I am that, by the way. 20 years since the World Series. 20 years, he did something right. So Major League Soccer is kicking off. So Don Garber, who wanted to really get a team into Miami, meets the media before every season. All commissioners do. You just saw Rob do his uh, avail, press avail before spring, during spring training. We talked about some of the things he said. Adam Silver speaks at the All-Star game. Don Garber, this is commissioners, what they do. Roger Goodell during the Super Bowl week, there's a media avail. Don Garber stood up, met the media, and the main focus was, hey, we're expanding, baby. He went full Al Davis and said, we've got two cities in the running for the 30th team. They want to be 30 teams. And then he said, no, no, the NFL and the NBA, the NFL has 32. Let's go 32. We could keep going. When you're getting expansion fees like Charlotte just paid for $325 million and you're Major League Soccer, you have no appreciable real revenue to speak of. The value of your franchise is going up because of demand, because people are dreaming that Major League Soccer will somehow not be a double A soccer league. And I'm not trying to make fun of Major League Soccer at all. It is a great league in the United States. But that's like saying 
that the Israeli Baseball League is a major league league. It's not. That's okay. The Korean Basketball League in basketball isn't either. You need leagues in every country. You want to grow the sport globally, I'm in. Major League Soccer for Americans, I love it. But Don Garber has a syndrome, which is he wants to be one of the four major sports. Is he going to take out the NFL? Certainly not. Is he going to take out the NBA? I don't think so. He's got his sights set, his sights set, his eyes set. Second side note, someone got to me on Twitter. Thank you. It was not Trojan horse yesterday. It was a straw man. Now, I have no idea what I was talking about, but if you listen to yesterday's show, I was looking for a word and I was looking for straw man, not stalking horse or Helen of Troy. So baseball, hockey, can he overtake one of baseball or hockey? That is what Don Garber thinks. He will, when he meets with other commissioners, like when there's during COVID, they all got to go to the White House and talk about what they were gonna do and Garber was all happy to be included in that meeting, though he expected to be and wanted to be. The fact is he wants to be one of the four major sports. So his view is let's keep growing the league. Let's keep getting the asset values of these teams going up and I'll do anything I have to do to do that. So he announces that either San Diego or Vegas are going to be ex the next expansion cities. If you're Rob Manford and you see that, do you panic? Because originally baseball was gonna be the first team in Vegas. Bud Selig said, no, we are not doing that. We are against gambling. We are not embracing it. There was no online gambling at the time. There was only illegal bookies. Pete Rose was suspended and there was no chance that MLB was ever going to get into Vegas. Then basketball talked about it, didn't do it. And hockey stepped up and became the first team in Vegas. The Golden Knights have been hugely successful. The NFL quickly followed suit and moved the Oakland Raiders to Vegas. They have been successful. Not a home run the way the Golden Knights were, but definitely successful. There's a whole new football stadium. They're hosting the Super Bowl, which by definition makes having a football team a success because of what the engine, the economic engine that will be driven next year's Super Bowl. So now you've got baseball talking about expanding or relocating. The A's are gonna move to Vegas. Vegas is where we wanna be. When you look at the city of Las Vegas, you tell me whether or not that size city can have all the major sports. I'm just throwing it out there. Do you think that there is a way to sustain football and hockey and baseball and soccer in Las Vegas? I love Las Vegas, viva Las Vegas. I'm going to Las Vegas to celebrate my niece's 21st birthday here next week. But the answer is no. When you look at the size of their DMA, when you look at the demographics, when you look at the entertainment options that are available, this is not like being the first team and only team to be in Buffalo or Green Bay. No offense, Buffalo or Green Bay, but I think you've got a better chance of success when there's not as much to do. And yes, I am biased. My bias comes from working in Miami for all the years and not being successful except on the field once, although we were in the playoffs a few times. Ah, uh, strike that. <laughs> 12, 60, 8, 9. We were competing to be in the playoffs many times, but only finished it off one time. But I would always say, yeah, our attendance stinks because everyone leaves Miami for the summer and there's so many great entertainment options that baseball is just one of them. If we were the only game in town, we'd sell out too. Or I would say my favorite line, which is even with our crappy attendance, we outdraw the Dolphins. I like saying that. Of course, we play 10 times as many games as the Dolphins, but don't bother me with the facts. So Don Garber said, we're going to Vegas. We're going to San Diego. We're gonna expand more. Okay. But then he announced a change in their playoff format. I don't know if you read this, 69% and that is purely a coincidence. It has nothing to do with this show. <sighs> Got it wrong, Coca. 62%. Maybe I was dreaming it would be 69%. They have changed their playoff format, so 62% of the teams are going to make the playoffs, which makes it the number one sport. NFL, it's only 44%. 14 teams make it. Major League Baseball, only 12 make it. 
NBA 16 make it, that's 53%. NHL, they put half the teams in, 16 of 32. But in Major League Soccer, 62% of your teams are going to make the playoffs. What does that say about your regular season? What we know about soccer, which is, hey, regular season games are cool, but get me to a cup. Get me to a tournament. So what MLS is doing is they're making tournaments. That's what all these sports are trying. Baseball has got the WBC starting up in a couple weeks. NBA is talking about an in-season tournament. MLB would like to get rid of the All-Star game and do WBC during the All-Star break. Major League Soccer talking about expanding playoffs tournament style. Why is that? I've got one word for you. Television. It is way more compelling television to show me a tournament elimination game than it is a regular season game on a Tuesday. So the more playoff games you can get, the better off you are. Does it cheapen the regular season? Of course it does, but who cares? We're past that. When you're trying to scrap and claw your way to be one of the four major sports, you are gonna do things out of the ordinary in order to draw attention to your league, in order to draw TV attention, in order to make the Apple deal work. Do you think it's a coincidence that Don Garber met the media from the new Apple Studios in New York City where all of Major League Soccer games are going to be streaming? Do you think that was just, oh, I was in the neighborhood? No, of course not. It's all meant to say that they're on the forefront of streaming, that they are the league that can command the most fees and the biggest percentage increases in those expansion fees. They're still growing. They're nascent. They're getting there. That's his goal. Don't kid yourself. Major League Soccer starts on Saturday. You guys pumped up? Do you know where your team is starting? All right. So baseball spring training is going on. A couple of things have happened that we've talked about that I just want to have you read about or listen to the show. We did a show about arbitration and explained to you why what Corbin Burns did, I didn't agree with, why it's not going to impact whether he signs with the Brewers or not, how hurt he was, how his feelings were hurt during arbitration. There is a Twitter thread by a Tampa Bay Rays pitcher named Ryan Thompson. Go search your Twitter. If you don't have Twitter, just Google Ryan Thompson. He explained his arbitration process, his hearing, and he did it in a very, very detailed way from a player perspective. And he was concerned and upset that the team, the Tampa Bay Rays, were using stats that he had never heard of, were trying to explain why he didn't deserve what he wanted, different player comparables, all the things that I've spoken to you about, except he wasn't angry with the Tampa Bay Rays. He's upset with the process, which is a player-driven process. It's still good to read about. So arbitration's done now. So we're heading into spring training. Games actually start tomorrow, which is pretty exciting, although it's spring training. If I told you my Jim Beatty story where I would text him after every spring training game in 2000 to say, way to go, we got to win. And he just would roll his eyes and say, David, spring training wins don't matter. Nah, come on, let's get the winning atmosphere in here. Let's win at the minor league level to show our major league team what winning is when our minor league players get here. It's such poppycock. Who cares? Win at the major league level in the regular season and then get trophies. That's it. So everyone starts pushing the boulder up the hill starting tomorrow. Spring training games are used by the front office to figure out who's going to play where. Get reps for the players, for the hitters, get enough at-bats, for the pitchers, get enough innings. Basically, you're putting together a jigsaw puzzle. When players are going to hit, how many at-bats they get, when they get them when pitchers are going to get their innings. Sometimes they'll play in a B game on a backfield. They'll play in a split squad or whatever they'll do to get their innings. But there's also new positions that are being played by players like Jazz Chisholm of the Marlins is playing center field. So he's got to get out there and they're going to want him playing as much center field during spring training as possible. So he can see balls in game situations. The problem is all the afternoon games in the Florida sun, that doesn't really match the experience that you get by playing night games under the lights in all these different stadia. So that's an example where Jazz Chisholm for the Marlins, who claims he's going to be MVP, will go early every road game the Marlins play when they go into a new city. He's going to go early and take extra fly balls, extra shags during batting practice, pre-batting practice to get to know his new position. Very common, smart of him to do, and he's going to do that. 
I was very interested to read that the Yankees are looking at position changes. The Yankees have to do something. Their addition is Carlos Rodon. They have a healthy DJ LeMahieu. Aaron Judge re-signed, as you know, that doesn't make them better. It just makes them costlier. And Aaron Judge told everybody that he is willing to do a position change. They have Harrison Bader playing center. And there's talk of Giancarlo Stanton playing right field and Aaron Judge playing left field. But Aaron Judge doesn't play left field. They say that put your best arm in right field. They say that left field is the easiest outfield position to play. Not this year, when it's possible the left fielder is going to be playing short right field to make up for the lack of the ability to shift. When all these ballparks, when left field, your defensive prowess is actually required. But what's interesting is that the Yankees, after all these years with Stanton, are finally listening to what we've told you for years. Stop DHing him. He's not a DH. And Stanton actually was finally willing to give a quote, which he normally doesn't do. He's such a good teammate. He doesn't want to make waves. But he actually said, FYI, I don't like being in the clubhouse watching the game on TV and trying to stay warm in the cage and going to hit one every nine times and then going back. I like being in the field. It keeps me in the game. It gives me the edge. I told you that Stanton wants to play the field. I don't know why Brian Cashman wouldn't have him. He's not exactly a bad fielder. If he plays consistently in right field, he's a gold glove caliber fielder. And the concern the Yankees have is over his health, as they should. But clearly what you're doing isn't working. Then why not try something else? So Aaron Boone, who was fighting for his managerial life, even though he just signed an extension, even though Hal Steinbrenner does not want to fire anybody, I think the Yankees have the most pressure of any team on them this year, actually. Aaron Boone came out and said, I'm thinking about judging left and standing in right. That's not how it works. Aaron Boone is not making the decision of where Aaron Judge is going to play. There is no chance. That decision is made by the front office. They will consult Aaron Boone, but they will say, Aaron, we need Judge playing left field in the following number of spring training games. We want Stanton playing right field for the following number of innings in spring training. Then come opening day, we're going to tell you whether or not Judge is going to be in left and Stanton's going to be in right. That's how it actually works. The fact that the Yankees are pondering this position change makes a whole lot of sense. When something isn't going right, you're not getting the results you want, you're not getting the health that you need, make changes. You don't need to fire all your trainers just for the sake of firing them. Change all of your pregame stretching and warm-ups. That's the easy way. That's what I would do. I never did, though. We kept our trainers almost my whole career, actually. I think even though some players didn't like the trainers. I did. You know, we had to fire a trainer once, but not for what happened on the field. But the point is, these position changes are part of the things that are being done during spring training. And the fact that the Yankees are looking at doing something which I would consider very serious by moving Aaron Judge out of position. You're talking about a guy who's playing under the pressure of a new deal, a substantial deal, a guy who could be playing a different position and a guy who's coming off a season where he's looking at himself and saying, I can't even match this. In my best days, I can't match this. And you're talking about an organization that has to figure out a way to live up to the expectation of not just getting to October, but getting through October with the pitcher who, by the way, is making $27 million a year as their new number two starter, Carlos Rodon. There are issues going on in New York. How will it all shake out? Well, we're going to see starting tomorrow with spring training games. That's it for this edition of Nothing Personal. Guess what? Tomorrow's February 24th. It's Friday. We'll have a show. It's just business. I'm David Sampson. This is Nothing Personal.